In my many years of watching anime, I have consumed a lot of anime titles. I think we're at about almost 1,800 titles in total. And with that comes the responsibility, no, the desire to let other people know about great titles that I absolutely adore that I think people should check out. And what better way of doing that than doing a top 10 list? And thus this video begins an adventure of mine. To travel back in time every single year to give my top favorite anime of every single year as far back as I can go until I can actually create a list. And while I have been aiming to watch every single title here recently in the last 10 or so years, I will eventually get to the point where there are some titles that I have not watched. So keep that in mind. The purpose of these videos are not to say that my anime are better than your anime, but it's just to highlight some titles that I think people, if they've missed them, should give them another shot. So with every single one of these lists, I do encourage people to go out there check out what titles they watched that year, what they love so much, and let me know down in the comments below. So with that said, let's begin this adventure with the year 2020, my top 10 favorite anime of that year. Starting from number 10, we have Wandering Witch, The Journey of Elena. Now I absolutely love Kino's journey. And the thing that I felt when I watched Wandering Witch, The Journey of Elena was Kino's journey. It is a concept of a girl who is born into this family and is raised with these great adventures of this one witch that traveled the world. So at the earliest point that she could, she learned magic, got really good at it, and eventually set out on her journey. And similar to Kino's journey, every place that she visits has its own story. And with each of those destinations, we get to see how she interacts with the people of that area. Some being more significant to her and some being less significant for her, but each one of them having her own tell of that particular place. But unlike Kino's journey, Elena is a little bit different. We established very early on that she's kind of full of herself. And so this often leads to some very interesting interactions and ultimately conflicts that she runs into that eventually shape her. A lot of these stories are very heartwarming. Some of them are comedic, but there's also a lot of them that are very dark. So keep that in mind. We do have some episodes where things get really heavy. So if you're a fan of Kino's Journey, like your locational storytelling, like magic, definitely give the series a shot. It looked beautiful. It was a great series. I love the characters. You cannot go wrong with Wondering Witch, The Journey of Elena. For my number nine, I have Princess Connect Redive. Yes, this is technically an anime based off of a mobile game, but hear me out. I was very surprised by this series. And I think the thing that really set it apart from most mobile adaptations is that it's primarily a comedy. And I think comedy works out really well for that formula. Add into that that we have the director from Konosuba, you really get the feels of Konosuba in the series. So if you're a fan of Konosuba, this is definitely a must for you. It essentially opens up with this girl named Kokoro who eventually has this boy fall from the sky. And she believes that he was sent by a deity. But he doesn't know about his background. He doesn't have any memories. He can't even talk. And as it goes along, more members are added to the party as they eventually open up a shop, take care of missions, and ultimately just get into shenanigans. You can say that the negative on this series is that it's, again, based off a mobile game. And so there's a lot of characters being introduced, mostly just probably to sell the gotchas for them. But every character added, every situation they get into is just pure joy and so many laughs. I laughed so much watching the show. Like I said, very reminiscent to something like Konosuba. It definitely has that flavor here. And it's a definite suggestion for me. For my number eight, I have It Invaded. This is an original series by Naz that was directed by the guy that did Alnoa Zero and Fate Zero. It takes place in a modern setting and follows a police organization that essentially utilizes this special technology in order to solve mysteries and hunt down criminals. Every time a crime is committed, they leave behind cognition particles and they take these cognition particles, put them into a system that allows somebody to enter into the mind of the killer and thus discover where they're at. It gets a little mind bending in that regard, the whole concept of stopping a crime before it happens, but a lot of the elements that they played out in it were really fascinating. I was extremely surprised about how much I enjoy this series and just how unique of a show it was and how unique of a story it is. They did announce a second season that was gonna come out for the series, but I haven't heard anything since then, but I cannot wait for more of this series. It's a fascinating world, interesting technology, and very mind bendy at times. For my number seven, I have ReZero Second Season Part One. Now, many might be asking, hey, why is this so low on the list? Well, it's kind of a two part, one being mainly that this is part one of two, and so not really much is resolved in this story, but I will say it's in this list because I still love ReZero to death, and there was so much character developments happening within this particular part. It just felt very 
anticlimactic because it was a part of a season. Even still, ReZero continues to be a series that I absolutely love, and I think especially with season two, a lot of answers were given to us for a lot of the questions we've been building up over season one. For those living under a rock, <laughs> It follows a guy named Subaru who is transported into another world. And there he has no real abilities. He's kind of weak, but he has one special ability that was given to him by the witch of this world that everybody fears. An ability he calls return by death. And this is essentially where he dies, he'll actually be reborn back at a certain set time. So it's almost as if he's trying to reach checkpoints, trying to save those around him and ultimately uncover the secrets of the world. It gets very brutal at times, very violent, but I always found it fascinating that depending on which direction he takes after each reset, we get a different story told and ultimately uncover more secrets about this world that I think is truly fascinating. So if you have not given this series a shot yet, do consider it. Continuing on my list, where I will have everybody basically said, so you put this above ReZero? So you put this above ReZero? <laughs> My number six, I have Sleepy Princess in the Demon Castle. This show was an absolute surprise for me. Looking at the artwork, looking at the PVs, everything told me I probably won't like this show. But when I watched the show, I could not stop laughing. This show is an absolute gem for comedy. The premise is simple. This demon lord has captured the princess of this kingdom and put her away inside of this prison cell within his castle. But what comes from this is essentially a princess who's just trying to get a good night's sleep. And so every single skit will involve her having a mission. I want a pillow. I need new sheets. I need to ward away mosquitoes. And so she'll sit on her venture, typically just getting out of the cell and walking around the castle until she finds things to put together to make her sleep better. And the gym is not in the princess. It's not in the mission she's given. It's a reaction of all the minions in the demon castle to what the princess does. The absurdity about what's happening around them and what she's doing. It is absolutely priceless. I love this series to death and I cannot tell you enough. If you like comedy, please go watch this. Moving on to my number five, I think this is probably the least watched show of the year. I'd have to double check, but this is something I think nobody really talked about and I was really hot on. And that is if my favorite pop idol made it to Budokan, I would die. Typically with idol shows, you follow the idols. You see what they're doing, how they gain success. Sometimes you'll see their fans cheering them on. But with If My Favorite Pop Idol Made It, it follows the fans themselves. And not only that, but a very interesting fan. <laughs> A fan that has this one idol that she cherishes so much. An idol from a group named Cham Jam. And this idol that she cherishes so much is the least popular idol in this entire group. But that doesn't stop her. Because after falling in love with this particular idol, She's going to do everything she can in order to support her and have her be successful. And so you have two areas of the show that make it so great. One is the absurdity of watching this fan basically do everything she can to buy as many handshake tickets as she can in order to support this one idol. But also the other side where you have this idol who obviously sees just how much danger they're putting themselves into by pushing themselves just for their sake. It's heartwarming and it's hilarious at the same time, and I just could not get enough of it. I was absolutely surprised how much this show grabbed me, both my heart and my laughs. Moving on to my number four, we have Kaguya-sama Love is War second season. Kaguya-sama Love is War continues to be a fantastic show. I was blown away by the fact in the first season, I figured this whole shtick would get kind of boring after a while. Like you have this concept of these two being in love with each other, but not wanting to be the first one to reach over and say, I love you. This competition of the two of them to force the other one to admit their love. But even thinking that this would get old, it never did. And going into second season, still thinking that's gonna happen, it never does. Now I will say in the second season, I was a little frustrated because it got a little more heavier in certain stories than I would kind of hope for the series to have. But even still, I could not stop laughing. I could not stop smiling. This is romantic comedy at its best. And I cannot say enough about this series as a whole. Moving on to my number three, I have Akadama Drive. This is a series that when I watched it, I really wasn't sure what I was getting into when I first started watching it. I knew that it had two very prolific names behind it, both the creator and the artist for Danganronpa. But at the same time, I've never got into a Danganronpa series before. And I cannot tell you enough how surprised I was at what this writer is able to do. It takes place in almost an alternative semi-future where you have mankind almost in a police state where if anybody steps out of line, these people known as the executioners will come and exact execution. And then you have the Akadama. This is a group of well-known criminals 
who all are specialized in some certain way. Well, after this random girl <laughs> gets caught up in something, she ends up being thrown in this mission that somebody pays all these Akadama to do, which is to first release one of the Akadama from prison, but then do this ultimate mission in order to transport a package to this holy land. And so while you have each of these Akadamas have their own traits to them, there's one that's a doctor who she's very skilled at doing anything surgery wise. You have the brawler who is just a big muscle man. You have courier whose whole purpose is driving around a bike and delivering things. But then you have this one girl who gets wrapped up in everything and is claimed as being the swindler. She's a normal girl but caught up in it and trying to act as if she's a part of it and that she's actually the swindler just to avoid getting killed. It's an amazing show with some fantastic style to it, great characters despite them being sort of in their archetypes, and overall the story had so many twists and turns and a fantastic ending to it that just had me breathless. I cannot say enough, go watch Akadama Drive. It is phenomenal. Moving on to my number two, I have The Day I Became a God. Now, hold on. I know this is probably going to upset some people, but this show hit me personally. This is a show that doesn't come very often. It's one of those shows where you realize that most people aren't that big on it. But for you personally, it kind of hits a personal note. Something in it connects to you. And for me, that was The Day I Became a God. Well, I won't get into the specifics of why that connects to me because I think it's semi-spoilers for some people. This show really had me. It essentially opens up with this guy named Yota, who eventually one day runs into this little girl that claims to be a god. She claims to be Odin and that she can see the future and that she claims this future is when the world ends. And the way that she proves that she is this god, she actually predicts some things that eventually kind of convinces Yota that this is true. Now the catch in this show is that this is by Jun Maida. And for those that don't know, Jun Maida does a lot of key series including Clonod air, little busters. And I will admit in the recent days, I have not been a big fan of Jun Maida. I like his works, but he kind of hasn't really gotten there for me lately. That same connection to the characters that I had with things like Clanod haven't really had recently, but I think this is a nice return to form for him because it does two things that I think Jun Maida is perfect at. It introduces the characters, it connects you to the characters by using comedy and some great little character moments, and then it breaks your heart. And like I said before, The Day I Became a God was a great return for Jun Maida. I absolutely love this show. It had so much heart. It had great characters. PA works knocked it out of the park with the animation and the character designs and everything. I just love this show to death. And like I said, the later parts of the show, getting involving into somebody technically losing themselves was something that at the time hit me personally and just had me bawling my eyes out. Plus there's a lot of different stories in there, including Kyoko, who just were great stories. And plus the comedy was great. They did a lot of spoofs of things like Rocky, Gordon Ramsay, Armageddon that were just priceless. So yeah, like I said, it's technically not gonna be for everybody, but for me personally, this was something that I'm gonna cherish for a long time. And moving on to my number one. If anybody knows Andrew, they're gonna know what I'm gonna say. A Sentence of a Bookworm, second season. A Sentence of a Bookworm has been a special series for me. Yes, it's an isekai, but at the same time, it does so much different than most isekais. It follows a bookworm from our modern times Japan who is eventually transported into another world but not just transported. She's put into the body of a girl named Mine. And Mine is a very sickly girl, a very ill girl, a girl that I speculate probably died that day and then she was placed into that body. But you get a real clear picture that this girl Mine just isn't having a great life. She's very ill, very frail, not able to walk around on her own. The core story then turns into this girl, this bookworm, who's now in this other world trying to find a book. The problem is that the body that she's placed into is a part of a family who's commoners. They don't have money. And books are kept for nobles. They're very pricey. There's something you just really can't have. So using her knowledge of the previous world, relying on the help of other people in order to move her around, she eventually starts to build up what she needs in order to eventually get those books that she so desires. But going to that key point of relying on others, a core thing about this entire series has been about family. It's about friends, those that you rely on, and ultimately those that you can trust. And this continues on in the second season when it has mine have to go into the church and serve the church and all the people that are involved there. And while I was afraid of the story when it went in that direction, it's one of those things where as it's showing me what it wants to tell, even though I want to go back over here, I loved it. And I said, give me more. Well, I don't want to go this direction. Oh, we're going this direction? Oh, I like this. 
everything the writer does eventually has me going, okay, I see what you're doing. I like that. Oh, I see what you're doing. I like that. I cannot say enough. I love this show. It has a great tone to it. It has great characters. Mine is a fantastic character, and I cannot wait for season three around the corner. But that's my top 10 anime of the year 2020. I hope you guys enjoy this video. Again, leave down in the comments what your favorite shows were of 2020. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. As I mentioned earlier, I will be doing a top 10 list for every single year going as back as far as I can before I run out of shows. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, leave a like down below. Consider supporting us on Patreon or the tips link in the description below. We definitely appreciate everybody that does. I hope that you all enjoyed and y'all take care.